further ado, uh, let's begin. So uh, thank you all for coming to um, this um, webinar we, we have today. Uh, this one is focusing on two hydroponic systems. I'll begin looking at buckets and then we'll shift to nutrient film technique. It's often been abbreviated NFT. Here's where we're at in the series. Um, so it's uh, Wednesdays at noon through this month. We're, we're here at the third of four um, today, October 18th, talking about buckets and NFT. Next week will be me again for the last of these webinars talking about deep water culture and ebb and flow. Um, this webinar series is presented by the OSU hydroponics team of which I am a part. I also have um, Dr. Lloyd Nackley, Black, Lloyd Nackley and Dr. Gail Ancelotto. Um, all of us in, supported in part by an ODA specialty crop block grant um, to bring hydroponics out to more people. Um, all right, so, all right, um, today's overview. Um, well, so first thing, here, here's a QR code. You're um, invited to um, participate in a survey about um, your experience in this webinar today. Um, you can grab it now if you want, uh, but don't worry, it will come up again at the end and I'll just leave it on screen as we get to the Q&A at the end of this webinar. So um, for today's overview, we're going to go through buckets first with the subtopics of what's in a name, making crop choices, a summary of their benefits and drawbacks, a quick look at the crack key variation on buckets, and then we'll shift to nutrient film technique where we basically just really dig into what's special about this one production style, um, the film of the nutrient technique. Uh, and then we finish it off with questions and answers. So, okay, first off, bucket hydroponics. Just, uh, I think the first, the very first thing is like, what's in a name? Why, why is it called buckets? Uh, first, it's because we're you know producing in buckets, uh, whether it be a repurposed or converted standard five gallon bucket, or these custom pieces with variably sized net pot caps and inserts that you can put on the top. Uh, this production style is characterized by growing plants in these buckets. However, Bucket is not uh, the ubiquitous name. Some people also call this style Beto style. Um, this is just because of uh, Beto Plastics. They were one of the original large companies who produced these buckets in the Netherlands as the hydroponic nursery industry uh, was really beginning to boom. Uh, it became synonymous with the idea and it's still talked about today, uh, you know, like Beto buckets or just buckets or Beto production. Uh, and again, they came out of uh, the Netherlands or uh, another name for this style is Dutch buckets. Um, the Netherlands are the number two country in the world for crop export uh, by value. Um, they're producing a lot of high value goods from high tech, highly controlled production environments, generally hydroponic. So we have three different names for the same style buckets, Beto and Dutch. Um, yep, Netherlands. Okay, moving on to the uh, crop choice. So for matching crops to these buckets to, to make the most of doing this versus some other version. We want to pick a longer lived crop. Um, so remember, we're, we're using buckets, individual buckets per plant. So we want something that has a long lifespan that we can um, grow for a while and keep in one space so that that labor of the individual assembly and maintenance of each one plant, one bucket, you know, high touch kind of environment, it's more suited to these longer lived crops that can stay in that uh, stay producing for a while rather than you know crops that are turning over maybe once a month like lettuce if we were growing lettuce in these buckets we would just be consumed by replanting buckets and cleaning them out and um just um you know putting a whole bunch of little buckets to single lettuce heads so we prefer longer lived crops it also uh lends itself well to vining styled crops um, tomatoes are a great example. Uh, again, um, not only are they longer lived, they are vining. This vining pairs well with that bucket system because you're already doing this high touch uh, crop, right? As it grows taller, you're going in there, attaching the trellis the first time and then re-trellising the plant every time afterwards, whether you're lean and lowering or just uh, continuing the, the trellis, you're in there um, giving each individual plant a high amount of attention. So let's just uh, embrace it and give them their own uh, production environment as well. Um, lastly, there's a version of um, kind of nursery style production where you just grow perennial crops, be it you know blueberries like in, like this example here, um, 
so that once you've set them into these buckets, they're kind of semi-permanent and you don't ever have to do that crop turnover and um, system clean out again. You just put the plant in there, you supply it with water and nutrients via these lines, and it could stay in that spot for decades. All right, last thing to uh, think about is that um, we're talking about making room for these roots. So, you know, again, we're focusing on these tomatoes, we're, we're choosing plants that have this large mass of roots. Um, we have the space for it. We're doing everything we can to give it like an individualized place um, so it doesn't have this competition. Um, and then additionally, since we've now reduced these plants down to single plants to a single bucket, they don't have, say, like a raft or a big pool that you see in other style of hydroponics to, to kind of support themselves. Um, each plant has to support itself. And so we need kind of a significant root mass to counterbalance and anchor uh, the top growth here. Um, and now, uh, just taking a quick aside on this variation of buckets, um, there's a much simpler version that could be used. It doesn't produce as a uh, larger crop or for as long, but we take, you know, kind of these standard needs of bucket production and we take out the aeration, we take out the pumps and we stop worrying about refilling it. Um, it's just a bucket of uh, nutrient filled water growing a plant. This is called the Kratke method. It was developed by Bernard A. Kratke at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. Um, basically just reduced the entire system down to like a plant once, grow once style, uh, uh, like a plug and play and forget kind of thing. You, you fill up the container, plant a seed. As it grows, it absorbs the water. And basically as you time it right, the, the water in the container is gone at or is finished at the same time that your crop is done growing. Um, so definitely look more into Kratky if you're um, interested in a very low tech approach to hydroponics. But um, now uh, back on to like just bucket parameters in general, whether it be the Kratky method or the bucket production method, um, the size of your container is really kind of a big thing affecting what uh, what crop you can grow. Again, we already talked about like the root mass. Um, but here we're now seeing that this really limits your water volume, uh, depending on, you know, what, of course, what size bucket you give it is how much water you can give the plant. Um, the roots can only grow in as big as the container is. And then, of course, at a certain point, um, the crop uh, just um, exhausts that water in the bucket and um, has to be harvested. Um, so, so this is kind of a reverse from the bucket production, which is focusing on more longer term uh, production. If we were now in this Kratky, um, crop choice for Kratky is actually looking for smaller stature crops, and especially ones that um, you don't want to choose root crops because uh, this net cup here, where the where the plant has to root through, uh, can really um, interfere with uh, your production style. Um, you know, make a carrot all mangled and grown through and fused to the cup, or cause the potatoes uh, to kind of gather and cluster and be really small inside the cup and not really get much beyond it. Um, it's possible, but it's difficult, uh, especially in the um, Kratky production. So um, the last thing about Kratky is that you especially need a blacked out container um, to keep those roots clean, because at least in bucket production, you have water and irrigation flowing that can disturb algae off those roots. Um, if they do accumulate in a crack key production, there's no movement, no aeration. And so we just need to pay extra attention on keeping the root environments clean and healthy. Um, so um, the benefits of bucket style hydroponic production is really a focus on isolating plant roots. Um, we're, pre we're preventing unproductive competition between these plants. Um, every single plant rather than being planted in the field on mass um, and and competing with one another and, and some of them losing and some of them winning that root battle we now give each of them a an individual space perfect for their growth um, it also allows quick and easy individual replacement if needed if one of them goes down you can take that one out use a valve and keep the whole system running um, you're, you don't you don't lose production time just because 
the uh, you, you had to replace a single crop. And then um, this, the last thing of this isolation, giving everyone their own unique line, their own unique fertigation and irrigation line means that you can ensure a, a similar and average dose to all the plants. So if we were instead to just kind of dump all the nutrients into the water over here, if they were all planted in a pool, we dump the nutrients in the water here, it's gonna be strongest here and getting weaker as we move across. And these plants are going to, uh, the, the plants furthest away from the feeding zone are always going to be the weakest. Um, with isolation and individual delivery, every plant gets the same amount of food to grow um, and you have a much more uniform crop. One of the one of the main benefits I really like about bucket production is that it gives you a really highly customizable use of space. So if you see, you know, this area here, if you're growing in a place that has, a, a, you know, two different elevations on your floor, you have a small step up or down or something in your garage or wherever, you're still able to put plants on the upper area and then the lower area, and you don't have to worry really so much about bridging this divide. It's it's easy to cross that with a pipe versus deep water culture where you're trying to put a pond across the whole area. And so now you've got this weird jagged edge. Um, buckets also, again, just like leaning into this customizable use of space. Buckets are easily elevated because you have a low weight. You're, you, it's just one plant per bucket, right? You have one bucket, as much water as is in that bucket, as much as one plant can grow, but that's it. You're not trying to move an entire pond or, or 30 plants at once. You're just moving one as needed. You put them where you where they can fit and you can just kind of arrange a system that doesn't have to be square. Um, uh, so it can really help you make use of um, ignored or, or otherwise unproductive or underutilized spaces. And then one of the last benefits of this bucket production style is that it's very simple and accessible to interact with. Um, while the system itself is a large network, everything breaks down into just these couple of pieces. You have, a, again, a bucket per plant. You've got hosing connecting it. You've maybe got drip hosing connecting that hose to this one. But then that's it. And you just repeat two or three pieces across every plant. So there's um, there's kind of a, a simplicity in, in, in an ease of replacement and fixing. Um, yeah, ease of readjustment you can. You can um, dial this irrigation in a little bit, especially you can, um, especially if you're trying to grow multiple crops across different ages and timelines. You can all you can add them all to the same irrigation system, the same main line, and just use individualized nozzles to control how much each plant gets. Um, so it's just I don't know, just just a really plug and play um, simple system. Um, and again, lightweight, like I said last time, um, just ultimately leading that is just quick to disassemble and move and clean up as needed. Uh, you just end up with a stack of buckets and, and lengths of tubing uh, versus, again, I'll compare it to the deep water culture where you just got this large pond. Like you can't fold up, stack a pond. Oh, uh, and then, so this one's pretty interesting. Um, growing plants hydroponically in general and in buckets specifically um, greatly or serves to greatly reduce the necessary rooting volume. So this comes from a book by Sonneveld in 1981. You can find it using this QR code here or the DOI. Basically found that growing tomatoes planted in soil, the roots took up about 200 liters of volume. Those same tomatoes planted in water took up about 20 liters of volume. So that's 10 times reduction in the space needed. Um, and, and again, this is something that holds true across hydroponics, but it, it's um, being taken advantage of in bucket production because we are giving, again, each plant just that. We're giving each plant those 20 liters. Um, we're not putting it in a pond where it's got about 20 plus because, you know, the, the plants don't stack quite as tightly. Um, we can give them just as little as they need and then that's it. Um, all right. So recapping the buckets. Uh, isolate the plant roots, highly customizable use of space. They're easily elevated and cleaned and take great advantage of the reduced rooting volume required by most crop, cropping plants. Um, 
some of their drawbacks are that they are sensitive to temperature fluctuations. So this can be ad addressed in a couple of different ways listed here. You can wrap the buckets in insulated material. You can bury the buckets in the earth, uh, you know, or otherwise, like, of course, if you're growing them hydroponically or in a greenhouse, you protect them from environmental changes. Um, but each of these buckets is just, you know, isolated in space. So the benefits of all the previous pages, uh, that, that specific individualized growing zone is now the drawback here because water's highly thermal conductive and um, it will cool quickly and um, hinder your crop growth. So kind of that individualized attention, that high touch is coming right back into play and you're either, you know, burying all these buckets into the, the earth below your greenhouse or wrapping them all in some kind of insulated material. Um, um, bucket hydroponics also have more complex plumbing. Um, they, they just, they, they have all these pieces, right? All this piping. So again, that individualism of the buckets, we've got whatever, whatever you need to grow a plant, you have that many pieces times however many plants you have. So it can quickly become, you know, I need a bucket per tomato and I want to grow a hundred tomatoes. That's a hundred buckets. That's a hundred buckets that you need to clean and sort and store and put somewhere. And that's a hundred irrigation lines and that's a hundred nozzles and just everything just compounds very quickly and, and becomes a lot um, to take care of and make sure it's, it's operating at, at um, peak efficiency. And then also uh, another drawback of this complicated plumbing is just that you have so many pipes going everywhere. Um, all this exposed piping can be damaged or knocked loose, you know, tripped on. Um, buckets are, especially if you haven't buried the buckets, um, they're susceptible to being knocked over. Um, so of, of course you're trying to be careful, careful around your plants in general. Um, but in, in, in bucket production, it's not just, you know, like, oh, don't snap off a leaf as you, as you walk by or something. It's like, don't step too widely and kick it and have the bucket fall and then the vine snap and maybe, you know, and maybe uh, the plumbing gets pulled or something. So, um, uh, there's just, there's a lot of pieces in a lot of places and you've, uh, got kind of a, um, complicated and, and uh, complicated terrain to work through. Um, so resummarizing their, the drawbacks of buckets, sensitive to temperature fluctuations, more complex plumbing, um, which is susceptible to accidental damage. Um, all right, so that was buckets. And if you've got any questions about those, we can talk about those after the other version. Um, so second half of the webinar, a twofer. Uh, we're talking about nutrient film technique or NFT hydroponics. Um, fairly iconic, looks a lot like this. I mean, you know, just rows of small thin channels almost um, almost like the gutters on the edge of a house roof, just rows and rows of them growing typically small plants like this. Um, in nutrient film technique, it is all about that film. That's what makes this technique special. Um, so here we have a cross section of a growing channel, you know, the, the borders of it here in black, got a little lettuce plant in a plug with some roots dangling down and with that film, that nutrient film technique, a very thin amount of water. Um, this gives us a large air gap, which, you know, leaves a bunch of exposed roots and a very high air to water contact. So a high surface area to volume ratio. So these roots can breathe really, really well. You're never going to have to worry about aerating your water or drowning your plants because so long as you only keep the water out of film, the plant roots have plenty of air to uh, respire. Uh, this um, this air gap can also be um, supplemented. Uh, it, it's the the cheapest, easiest way to provide CO two supplementation. Um, you can just fill these channels with CO two, so you're giving the roots more CO2 so that the plant can grow faster. Um, but you have a contained environment here, so you're not having to raise the ambient level of your entire greenhouse, uh, which is expensive and also depending on how high you go, uh, can reach like kind of danger, health hazards with um, human workers. So just being able to seal these 
little troughs and then pump them full of CO2 um, is just a really, really great way to take NFT to the next uh, level. Um, but on the note of how to set it up, like, you know, this is the next level, how to even begin, uh, we're looking at, at a slope. Um, so this nutrient film technique, they're growing in these channels and you're just plumbing it on one side and it's flowing through and coming out the other side. The two most common recommendations you can find is to have a slope of about, or yeah, a slope of an inch per yard or a 2% slope. Those are the two that I see cited most commonly. So we're going to figure out what that means real quick. Uh, we'll have this as our exaggerated slope, this black line. Um, the rise or fall is uh, the difference between the lowest and the highest portion. And then the run is the difference between one end to the other. And so we're kind of just making this triangle with the hypotenuse being our slope, um, our, our, our grade of slope. And at this point, we can convert between both of these approaches pretty quick and easy. So if we take the first one, one inch per 36 inches times 100 gives us a 2.8% slope. You know, an inch per yard gives us an almost 3% slope. Uh, a little bit steeper than the other recommendation of 2%. But what is 2%? 2% uh, is a 2% unit rise or fall per 100 unit run. So this would be, you know, if I had 100 inches of channel, then I want a 2% rise um, or fall from, from one into the other. Uh, this, you know, all this is coming into um, trying to perfect this film because it's, it's all about the film in nutrient film technique. Uh, we're trying to perfect the film that we're uh, flowing through this channel. So if we take kind of a top-down view of the channel, um, this is the input area, this is the output, or the, the, the higher end of the channel, the lower end of the channel. But again, we're looking down on it. And so first thing we wanna do is keep these channels, to, to get a good film, we wanna keep these channels at or shorter than 50 feet, because as you drip the water in here, this is exaggerated, of course, but by the time it gets to the end, um, there's a there's a much skinnier, you know, imbalance of spread to the water. In part because the plants along the way are taking it up, so there's just simply less volume at the end than at the beginning. Um, but also just uh, by nature of physics, right? Like uh, you can pour water through the entire channel at the top, but if it's flowing down, it's kind of pulling on itself and coming together. And so by the time it's coming out the end. It's, it's just, it's thinner. Um, so keeping your channel shorter helps this not become as much of a problem. I mean, it's gonna be occurring no matter the length of your channel, but this becomes a real big issue if your channels are, you know, beyond 50 feet. At a hundred feet, you know, you could see a, a significant change. In fact, to a point where the plants at the end might not get any water um, and, or you'll have to pump so much water at the top end to, to to irrigate the ones at the bottom end that you no longer have that film at the top end. So you don't have the best part of this production style. You have at, at this up, upper end here, you have plants with submerged roots that are in danger of drowning and um, can't benefit from the high atmosphere content, content and definitely aren't benefiting or barely benefiting from any CO2 supplementation. Um, so keep your channel short. That's what I'm saying there. Um, you're also aiming to minimize discharge. So you want them to be short so that you don't have this um, falling away of the channel so that the plant can get enough water before the end of the channel. But you also want it so that you have as little water coming off the end as possible. Because uh, again, film, right? We're looking for a thin amount of water. If we have a significant rate of discharge, then we're probably not running a film. We probably have something a bit deeper. Um, so we're just playing this balancing act of trying to have as little coming out as possible, but also it needs to be coming out. And also you want the one at the end to get an equal drink or, or you know, within five-ish percent of the one up above. Um, one last uh, somewhat new innovation that you can, uh, that's been used to kind of fight this, um, this channeling, this, this water cohesion is the use of a textured bottom. So again, we're looking down on it. And so as you look down into the, the, the grow channel, they'll have, some of them have ridges, some of them kind of do a little bit of like a diamondy pattern. But basically what's happening 
as the water's coming in here across a, across a clean bottom, as we, as we talked about the water cohesion and, and it, and it uh, pulls together by the end. But with these lines, that water is kind of getting pulled by its own cohesion where we're pushing it, we're, we're making it spread itself out because it's trying to grab each of these uh, ridges. And so it, it just helps the, the water still will be pushing together because of the slope, but it'll also be pulling itself apart because of um, this texture here. A uh, little bit more expensive um, compared to the non-textured channels, uh, but solves a lot of problems and uh, is worth it in my opinion. Um, all right. We're gonna get back to some water and thermal dynamics. We talked about it for a second with buckets. It's even more important with nutrient film technique because we're basically, as when it comes to heat, we're, we're basically mimicking what's been done with uh, radiative heat. You know, you turn on your radiator, it's, you know, heating a fluid and pushing it through a conductive material to heat the temperature around you. Well. We're basically we've got kind of the reverse now we have um water flowing through thin channels and water is highly thermally conductive um so on hot days the water flowing through those thin hot channels or you know it's being the atmosphere is heating the channel which is heating the water and then we get hot water pretty quickly like as soon as you're running through those channels it's heating up the water um but if you you know come nighttime uh, as temperatures drop, if you pump your water through the night, most people don't, because if you pump through the night, now you have a cold atmosphere chilling your channel, which is cooling your nutrient solution. And sure, there can kind of be a balance as you try to, you know, make it energy efficient and um and then um try to try to keep the the nutrient solution um stable, but uh, but we're basically just kind of constantly combating the water temperature we want compared to the atmospheric temperature that we have um, because large temperature swings slow plant growth um, and this is this effect is pronounced exaggerated in hydroponic production because we are in a highly controlled environment um, and so plants are kind of um, speeding down their growth uh, their, their growth trajectory and so if we have temperature swings that are kind of mediated outside, um, but if we if it's too hot for a day or too cold for a day or something inside, um, we can really see some loss in crop production. Um, I'll just take a quick quick example. Um, so we have there was a study that showed lettuce grown at three different temperatures: eighteen degrees centigrade, twenty one centigrade, and ambient, so twenty to twenty six. Um, the lettuce or the, the 18 one failed to perform. So it ended up being 21 is the preferred one. And then let lettuce just let grown at whatever it was, you know, colder during the night, warmer or yeah, warmer during the day. And so the outcome is that the, um, whoops, where we go? There we go. The lettuce grown at the perfect temperature at the controlled temperature had 15% greater biomass. However, it had, you know, lesser bricks. The one grown at ambient temperature had 20% greater bricks, so it tasted sweeter. Um, it was just a more pleasant lettuce to eat. Um, so I don't know. I mean, they, we're still we're still um, figuring out which way you want to do things, right? Like, it, if you control the temperature better, you're going to get more growth from that crop, uh, but you're, it's not going to be as tasty. It's not going to sell as good or it's not going to eat as well and get your repeat customers. Um, so, um, whoops, sorry, I had a double slide. If you want to find out more about that, that's from Fakula et al. in 2021. You can pop it, uh, that QR code here, that DOI there. Um, moving on to channel choice, like materials that you want to grow your plants in. Um, we're basically looking for food safe acid stable uh, um, materials um, so the fda does have standards for food contact surfaces in particular you can look at the national sanitation foundation um, nsf 51 is 
basically what you want to find that's the food safe acid stable designation um let me see and channel choice oh as far as designs yeah so this is an important one as well um most designs out there have this flat bottom most diy do-it-yourself designs not most sorry um some diy designs are using like pipes cut in half or various things that have a rounded bottom um the flat bottom is better for a number of reasons uh, you get a greater volume of water especially when you're trying to do a nutrient film if you're just trying to put the bottom couple of millimeters that's a much greater volume than the bottom couple of millimeters of this it's just it's barely you know a quarter of the of the distance um you just have improved flow of the water across here um greater solution and atmosphere contact because there's greater surface area. And then lastly, the thing to, that I think gets overlooked so many times in these DIY efforts is the flat bottom just makes it easier and more stable when you mount, um, mount these channels. Um, and then I just wanna go over materials just for a second. This table's got a lot of information, but it's just to show you that like, there's a lot that you can, there's a lot of differences depending on which plastic you fit, you choose, right? Um, these five different materials of, of common hydroponic plastics, how much they flex, if they're impact resistant, if they're thermal resistant, if they're UV stable, none of them are unless they have additives. Um, but it's just basically like, there's no right answer so long as you use a food safe acid stable um plastic there's no right answer so much as finding what circumstances you're in and, and what you need to what what you're um prioritizing for your material all right and then the last thing i want to mention about um nutrient film technique is that it's very very uh easy to gain productive space with these things so if we pretend that these are all these grow channels here, um, we've got some serious vertical potential because we can just take a single pump, push it to the top of the highest channel and just kind of rig them so that, you know, it flows through and then gravity feeds the next one and then gravity feeds the next one and then gravity feeds back to the pump. Um, so we can make a simple system out of um, NFT while um, uh, uh, still just like uh, stacking up space, even putting this um, up a wall or something like that. So um, yeah, nutrient film technique, um, all about the film, all about growing smaller crops very quickly in um, kind of these thin channels of air, channeled area. Um, all right, so that's uh, my presentation of these two types of um, hydroponic systems. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or, um, yeah, just go ahead and type them out now. Uh, we've definitely got some time. Um, so hoping to just see um, what people might be interested to uh, know about these two styles of production, any questions they might have had come up. Um, and yeah, you can fill out, please fill out this uh, survey in response to this webinar. Um, just kind of let us know how we're doing and what else you might want to know from future webinars. Um, yeah. Um, that's buckets and nutrient film technique in hydroponics. Thank you, Michael, that was great. Um, I have a question and because I have um, a host on the seminar, I, I actually can't type it into the Q&A pod, so I'll just unmute and ask it. Okay. I'm wondering if, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like the bucket technique is more of a, a starter system and NFT um, might be a little bit more of an advanced hydroponic system. Is that an incorrect assumption to start with? Um, are you meaning like just in us, how easy it is to get started? Yes. Um. Yeah, I, I mean, buckets are a lot more approachable. Um, you can scale it a lot easier and just add a bucket as you're ready. And you can make these systems 
from stuff you probably have lying around um nft yeah, is a lot more specialized like you can do it yourself but i don't i don't think a lot of the publicly available materials that people make nft themselves out of are the best options like i see a lot of things a lot of people manipulating vinyl downspouts or fence posts and vinyls not acid stable um and so you're just like actively leaching vinyl into your nutrient solution as you irrigate your crops um so yeah nft i mean they're at the end of the day they're both hydroponically growing but yeah i think the the bucket system's just simpler easier e easier maybe not simpler easier thank you yeah. then i have a follow-up question sure. um sure because you're giving us a tour for hydroponic systems and there are a lot of materials that are needed for each one. I'm just wondering about the potential to move from um, buckets to NFT, for example, and to repurpose and reuse materials, or do you almost need to start from scratch in terms of um, purchasing and putting together another system? Um, some of it, like the core of all hydroponic can transfer like your your pumps and your tubes and your irrigation lines and, that, and your aerators and that kind of stuff it's what you're going to have to get new is the growing space each time for nft that is the channels and those channels cannot become buckets and buckets are not going to become like a deep water culture pond right like you can you can move the pump over you could throw the aeration stone in you could grab your leftover nutrients um but but you're yeah it's like like yeah like 50 50 take it take the core and then add on the new pieces thank you for that and you have a question in the q a pod um from matthias um what about using a material to slow down and spread the nutrients yeah okay so i didn't mention this but um there there are options to get um little rolls they're like usually four inches because they're most nft channels are four inches i mean you can get a match to whatever size but generally it's four inches and um they're just little rolls of inorganic substrate um that some people use to just run nft and grow um, like microgreens. And so they just litter the whole thing with seeds. And then other people use it as, as kind of what you're talking about to just help slow it down and wick the water and just kind of basically like force the film effect onto, onto the water. Yeah, great question, thank you. Well, Michael, I want to thank you for taking the time to teach us about two um, hydro system this week. And thank you for being on the schedule to teach us about two new ones next week. And also want to take a moment to thank everyone who was here today um, to listen and learn with us. I'm aiming to have um, this video edited and posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, within 24 hours, the link should be automatically sent to you via the automated Zoom emails, which will go out tomorrow at about noon. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Michael, and hope to see you all again next week. Yeah, thank you.